Welcome to a day of creationism from the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia, featuring Ken Ham with Answers in Genesis Ministries. And now the conference host, Dr. Jerry Falwell. I'm Jerry Falwell, senior pastor here for the past 46 years. And I'm very excited about what's going to happen in this sanctuary today. Ken Ham is founder and president of Answers in Genesis. He is one of the leading Christian scientists, and I put a hyphen between the two, meaning he is a committed Christian and a dedicated scientist and a creationist, and he will be teaching us today all day here on the Liberty Channel from 9 till 3 about biblical creationism. That's 9 to 3 Eastern time. You should call a friend right now. Maybe you've uh, a friend who's an evolutionist or not sure about the origin of species and what the Bible has to say about creation and what scientists have to say. This day could change your life. A day of creationism at the Thomas Road Baptist Church. Ken Ham is our speaker. In this first hour, and there'll be five messages in five different hours. That's 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to noon, and then 1 to 2 and 2 to 3. There'll be a break for one hour for lunch for the people here in the sanctuary, and we'll have a very special program aired for you across the Liberty Channel. This first message is entitled, Where Did God Come From? Defending Creationism in a Scientific Age. You can be a profound scientist and a dedicated Christian and creationist at the same time. As a matter of fact, I think that's the only conclusion that makes sense. Now let's go into the sanctuary of the Thomas Road Baptist Church, A Day of Creationism with Ken Ham. Well, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. I hope you get used to this Australian accent. I always tell people you have to anyhow because you're going to speak it in heaven, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how we go. Well, you know, a lot of people must be really confused about the creation evolution issue because you think about it. The late Dr. Carl Sagan made this statement. He said, the cosmos is all it is or ever was or ever will be. In other words, in the beginning, the cosmos. And then he believed that there was a big bang billions of years ago and out of that big bang eventually came the, the stars and then the sun and then the earth is a hot molten blob and then the earth cools down for uh, uh, millions of years and then we find that life evolves in some primeval soup and as you can see then onward upper progression one kind of animal changes into another ape like creatures into people till you get your average American up the top there as you can see. Uh, <laughs> but um, you see if evolution's true, then supposedly as well, uh, there's a record of the evolutionary history of life left in the fossil record where we see these fossils all over the earth and supposedly that represents then millions of years of earth's history. But if you take the Bible and if you take God's word, it says not in the beginning the cosmos, but in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And it says that God created in six days, not millions of years. In fact, we'll talk about that in one of the other sessions, about the literal days of creation that the Hebrew word for day in Genesis 1 has to mean an ordinary day in the context there. And then we have this history, and I want you to follow through this history with me, that God created a perfect creation in six days, and then something happened, sin and death entered the world, and then we have the catastrophe of Noah's flood, a confusion at the time of the Tower of Babel. God gives different languages that would form different people groups all over the world. The flood of Noah's day would form fossils all over the world. And by the way, there was bio biology on board the ark because you had land animals on the ark. The ark lands on Mount Ararat. Those animals migrate over the earth. Jesus Christ steps into that same history uh, to become a man, dies on the cross, raised from the dead. One day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth to come. And uh, uh, here we are today in Thomas Road Baptist Church. <laughs> uh, but, but you see... That history is very, very different, isn't it? A very, very different history to the one that Carl Sagan uh, talked about. In the beginning, the cosmos. In the beginning, God. Millions of years, well, just thousands of years. No global flood. There was a global flood. God created the first man from dust. No, he, he evolved from ape-like creatures. You think of how different those views are. Can't you see how people must be confused? Why is it? How can we have such different views about the origin of the universe? 
Well, let me ask you all a question. You know, pretend we're in a, in a classroom here in, in school, because I was a high school teacher, so I like to, you know, be a teacher when I'm out the front. So let me ask you a question. Do creationists and evolutionists, do we have the same earth or different earth? You tell me. Ah, oh, we have the same earth, okay. Do we have the same fossils or do we have different fossils? Same fossils. Do we have the same animals? Real animals, as you can see, not, not things like deer and so on, you know, real animals like kangaroos, but do we have the same animals? Yeah, we have the same. Do we have the same world? Yeah, there's a map of the world. We have the same world, that's right. See, <laughs> just a little bit of bias coming out there. Do we have the same dinosaurs? In fact, you can see dinosaurs on the stage here from our sculptor, Buddy Davis. In fact, you'll hear from him a little later on when he sings. But here's, here's the point. Creationists and evolutionists, do we have the same facts or different facts? Same facts. Ah, so think about this for the moment. We have the same facts. We have the same evidence. Is the fight about facts? No, it's not. You know what the fight is about? How you interpret the facts. And how you interpret the facts depends upon what? The beliefs that you have to start with. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes I get on radio to debate some of these humanists or evolutionists, and they say to me, ah, oh, so you've got all these facts for creation. I say, actually, I've got the same facts you do. <laughs> and they sort of go, huh? <laughs> and, and then they say to me, but wait a minute, we're on about science, you're on about religion. You know what I say to them? Actually, I have no problems with your science. <laughs> No problems at all. You see, it's not just science I disagree with. Because, see, I have the same science you do. I have the same genes in, in, in the present. I, I believe in the science of genetics, the science of natural selection, the science of geology. Hey, we have the same rocks. We can go out and look at them and decide if they're sedimentary, igneous, metamorphic. We have the same facts. We have the same Grand Canyon. We have the same biology, the same geology, the same zoology, the same astronomy. You know what the difference is? The difference is how you interpret the facts. You see, if you look at this picture here, you'll notice... If you start with a revelation that God, who has always been there, has revealed to us the truth about history, which is what the Bible claims to be, a revelation from one who knows everything, and the Bible tells us when God made animals, he tells us when death came into the world, he tells us when he made the universe and so on, then when you look at the world through that pair of glasses, see I have on my glasses so that I can see uh, my computer for instance, and so I can see you, that really helps too, doesn't it? But you see, when I'm looking through my glasses, do you realize everyone has on a set of glasses? We look at the evidence in the present because all the evidence does exist in the present. In fact, all of you exist. Well, I hope you all exist in the present. When I was a teacher, not all my students existed in the present, but <laughs> hope you exist in the present. But see, what we're doing is this. We're trying to connect the past to the present. We have the present. How do we connect the past to the present? How do we do that? Well, the only way you could do that is if you knew what happened in the past to connect it to the present. What happened in the past to bring the animals here? What happened in the past to cause death to be here? What happened in the past to bring humans here? What happened in the past to cause fossils? What happened in the past to, to form the Grand Canyon? Well, we have a revelation for one who says, I know everything, I've always been there, here's what happened in the past. So when we take that revelation, put on our set of glasses, and we look at the evidence, we can say, ah, oh, now I understand. Fossils couldn't have formed before sin. There was no death before sin. There was a global flood that connects to geology. God made distinct kinds of animals and plants that connects to biology and so on. But you see, if you don't believe God's revelation, then you have to have beliefs about the past based on the words of men who don't know everything who weren't there. And you see, that's what evolution really is. It's really a belief about the past. No one was there to see chemicals form into, into cells or anything like that. No one was there to see uh, ape-like creatures turn into people. or No one was there to see the Grand Canyon uh, being formed and the layers being laid down all over the earth. And so they have certain beliefs as an evolutionist or people who believe in millions of years. They have on a different set of glasses, but they're looking at the same evidence. You know one reason why sometimes Christians and non-Christians, creationists, evolutionists argue and don't get anywhere? Because we're arguing up here. Can't you see what I'm talking about? No, I can't see what you're talking about. It's obvious. No, it's not obvious. You know what the problem is? You're looking at the same evidence through different glasses. And what I wanted to show you is this, that when you really get down to it, the main argument is down here at this foundational level. In other words, the beliefs you have that put on the glasses that you have to start with. Look, let me, let me sort of do a little experiment with you here to help us uh, understand this, okay? I want to put up for you my favorite fact. There it is. Isn't that nice? I think everyone should have one of those. And I'm going to ask you a question about that fact. What do you think is missing? What do you think that most likely was originally? What do you think is missing? Okay, let me give you some options. Who would say um, it, it, it originally was A? Anyone say A? Who would say B? Usually get one text and says it was no, no text. Okay. Uh, who would say C? Uh, D, anyone say D? <laughs> How about uh, E? Who says E? Okay, and who says uh, F? Some, something else. Well, you know what? 
Most people, when I ask that question, what is missing, the answer they give is E. They say, well, it was a circle. Well, actually, nothing is missing because I drew it that way. <laughs> now, <laughs> very, very important point for us that I want us to understand. You know what happened? I put up a fact for you, but you realize that facts by themselves are meaningless. See, all the facts are the same. Isn't that what we said? All the facts are the same, but facts by themselves are meaningless. And what happened in reality was this. Let's go back to our other diagram again. I gave you a presupposition about which to think about that fact. I said something is missing. You put on your pair of glasses. Okay, something's missing. I'm going to fill it in. You interpreted the evidence. Your interpretation was it was a circle. By the way, your interpretation was totally consistent with your glasses, totally consistent with your presupposition. It was just totally wrong. See, when I asked you a question, you know what I did to you? I conned you all. I made you think the way I wanted you to think about the evidence. See, when I asked a question, in reality, what we should have done was we should have said, wait a minute, you asked a question, what's missing? I should question his question. Most of us don't even know it's a question, let alone to question the question, let alone to know the right question to ask about the question. That, see, that's the problem that I find. See, it's like we pick up a newspaper and a scientist says, we dated this fossil be so many million years old. And people say, oh, that's wonderful. Isn't that great? <laughs> Excuse me, what questions did they ask to get that interpretation? And if you don't know the questions, how do you know what questions to ask to question their question to see if they're asking the right questions? And the more we research it, the more we're saying, we need to ask some questions <laughs> because they're asking the wrong questions. So you see, well, I'll give you a practical example here. I mean, evolutionists talk about missing links. What do they find? Nothing. What do they label them as? Missing. <laughs> now, well, think about this. Are they missing in the evidence or is it their theories are wrong to start with? And so what I want us to understand is this. The facts are the same. The science is the same. Do you realize what I did to you with that circle is what the newspapers do to you every day and, and what the news media do on television to you every day, you know, wh whether it's about Israel or Afghanistan or wherever it is. When I watch the news, I'm saying to myself, am I seeing the truth about world history? No, I'm seeing someone's interpretation of the evidence based on the presuppositions they have, <laughs> which is why I give up reading newspapers these days. I'm not sure what I can believe anymore. But you see, everyone... Everyone interprets evidence. And what I'm going to say to you today is this. If the Bible is what it claims to be, a revelation from God who knows everything has always been there, and if the history is true to connect the past to the present, we should be able to put on a set of glasses that not only makes sense of the evidence in the present, but we can use real science to support it and defend it. And you know, that's, that's exactly what I can show you. Real science goes against the glasses based upon the belief in evolution. But real science confirms the glasses based upon what the Bible teaches. And I'll give you two practical examples uh, in this session. First of all, let's go back to that statement of Carl Sagan. In the beginning, the cosmos. The cosmos is all it is or ever was or ever will be. The first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. By the way, if that verse is not true, neither is the rest of the Bible. You realize that? So if somebody says to you, how do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? You know what Paul says in Romans 1.20? If you don't believe in God as creator, you're without excuse because it's so obvious that there's a God. So obvious there's a God? And that's why 1 Peter 3.15 tells us always to be ready to give reasons for what we believe. Always be ready to give reasons for what we believe. Well, let's get some reasons for what we believe. If somebody said to you, how do you know there's a God? What would your answer be? Isn't it true that in our Sunday schools and churches, one of the main ways we've taught in the past concerns the design argument? Design implies a designer. You know what I mean, don't you? You find a watch. It's obvious it didn't get there by chance. Uh, somebody had to design a watch. Your brain's more complicated than a watch. Somebody had to design your brain. Isn't that one of the major arguments we've used? Right? For instance, when you came into this really uh, beautiful church building, I'm sure, like me, you looked at it and said, wow, it got here by an explosion in a brick factory. I mean, that's <laughs> obvious, isn't it? Well, of course not. You know that somebody designed this building. Or if you uh, take Mount Rushmore, okay? And by the way, my favorite president is there, uh, Mount Rushmore. Uh, I don't know whether you know why he's my favorite president, but I get embarrassed when kids ask me if I'm a living fossil or something like that. <laughs> I, I tell them, well, at least I look like an honest, honest president, so that's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Although that suited more in, a few years ago. But anyway, how did the president's heads get there? Well, I've got a theory. I think what happened was this. Millions of years of wind and water erosion uh, acting on Mount Rushmore, and eventually, of course, uh, you know, we end up with the president's heads. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> we did a little doctoring of that, too. 
but isn't that the major argument we've used? Hey, I've got news for you. The church needs to catch up with the world. You know why? Because the world says, we've got an answer to that. Richard Dawkins, leading evolutionary spokesperson from Oxford University, you know what he said? We have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed to have come into existence by chance. You know, Richard Dawkins is a leading evolutionist. He wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker to refute the design argument. And you know what they teach kids in universities and schools now? Look, as animals evolved, they, the only those that were adapted to their environment are the ones that survived. So obviously they're going to look designed. So therefore apparent design is not evidence of God, it's evidence of evolution. Now what do you do? See, we've got to counter that argument. And by the way, there is a counter to that argument that evolutionists can't answer. In fact, it's so exciting being a Christian. It really is. Let me show you. See, life is built up on the basis of information in our genes. In fact, I, I like to give analogies to help people to understand this. You know, in, we're made of trillions of cells and nearly all of our cells, we have all the information that builds us. It's sort of like this. If you take a rope and you put beads on the rope representing dots and dashes, if you know the Morse code, you could write the entire Bible on a piece of rope. Well, in a sense, you have these ropes of DNA and these sequences, genes, these molecules lined up in the right order that have all the information that builds you. Estimated to be for uh, each person about 1,000 books, 500 pages, close type written. A lot of information, isn't it? Well, where did that information come from? Well, that's what we need to look at because, you see, when I went to university, my professor said, oh, as long as those molecules lined up in the right order, as long as they lined up in the right order, millions of years ago, we could uh, get life. And they said, look, let, let's have some examples here. For instance, uh, let's take the alphabet and put the alphabet in a hat and, and mix them up and then pass the hat around a class and three students in a row pull out B followed by A followed by T. Wow, we got a word by chance, random processes. Given enough time, we could get words. Given enough time, we could get the encyclopedia. As improbable as it seems, as long as you get the right order, you could get life. And so they say, see, you don't need God. As long as those molecules lined up in the right order millions of years ago, you could get life. But you know, there's something dreadfully wrong with that analogy. You know what it is? Who is that word to, that word B-A-T? Is that a word to a Dutchman or a Frenchman or an Irishman or who is it a word to? It's only a word to somebody who already has what? The language. Without the language, the word is meaningless. See, here is a word. See that word up there? That's the word days. That's the word days in German. How do I know that? Do I know German? I haven't got a clue. But a German told me that was the word days in German. I hope it's the word days in German. I don't know whether it's the word days in German. But my point is, that is meaningless to me because I don't know the German language. But if you know the German language, presumably that order of letters there is meaningful to you. Now here's the interesting thing that we need to understand. The molecules in our ropes of DNA the order is actually meaningless, except, you know what's exciting? In the biochemistry of our cell, there's actually a language system, a code system that reads the DNA to make it meaningful. And in, do in doing so, it actually makes the code system that reads the DNA that makes the code system that reads the DNA that makes the code system. You get the idea? You can't have one without the other. See, life is like that at a macroscopic level. Sort of like, you know, when I was flying in an airplane, a 747 back from Australia, my wife said, do you know this plane's made of six million parts? I said, oh, interesting. She said, yes, but not one part flies. <laughs> do you realize an airplane is a collection of non-flying parts? <laughs> Think about that the next time you're flying. <laughs> but when it's all together, it works. You know, life is like that. For instance, in Australia, we have mosquitoes. You have mosquitoes over here, don't you? Yes. <laughs> I know we live in Kentucky, we have lots of mosquitoes. But Here's what I like to do to mosquitoes. We call them mozzies, by the way. But I want to ask you a question. Why did that mosquito die? So you squashed it. Yeah, but, but look, that's, that's got all the RNA and DNA and everything's all there. That's the best primeval soup an evolutionist could ever ask for. You know why the mosquito died? Because I disorganized it. <laughs> See, look, here's an experiment you can do at home. If you take a frog and you put it in a blender, okay? <laughs> now, you can say to someone, here I have a disorganized frog. <laughs> and just leave it sit around and see if it organizes itself back again. Well, you know that's not going to happen, right? <laughs> Actually, you know, there's a man called uh, Dr. Michael Behe. He's not a biblical creationist like myself, but from Leahy University. And he wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box. And you know what he said? 
When you get down to the biochemistry of a cell, do you realize in the biochemistry of a cell, you have all these machines, they're biochemical machines. In other words, just to sense like and turn it into electrical impulses isn't a simple little task. It takes all these different molecules, all the right place, right time, right concentration, all together, page after page of all these things, all together, or it won't work. And you've got that biochemical machine and another one and another one and another one all communicating together like a big plant making motor cars with all these robots working together. And he said, life is built on machines. He said, you, you, you can't believe in chance random processes. But you see, there's even a more powerful argument than that because Richard Dawkins would argue, oh, those machines just came about by chance. But those machines came from the blueprints on our DNA. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you believe in evolution, matter had to produce the information and code systems for life to start with, to build the machines. Now, there's a German scientist, Dr. Werner Gitt, that has done a lot of work on this. You see, if you believe in evolution, what he's saying is, hey, matter had to produce code system, a code system and information, and over millions of years, millions of times, you had to get new bits of code and new information. Do you know the interesting thing? Scientists have never seen one example, even one, where matter gives rise to one piece of information. And if you believe in evolution, it happened to happen millions of times. For instance, in his book, In the Beginning Was Information, I think this is probably the most powerful book today that devastates evolution scientifically. I really do. Here's a couple of statements from Dr. Gitt. He says this, There is no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information, neither is any physical process or material phenomenon known that can do this. Matter can never give rise to information on its own. We've never seen it happen. He goes on to say, A code system is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intelligent origin or inventor. It should be emphasized that matter as such is unable to generate any code. We've never seen matter generate code. All experiences indicate a thinking being voluntarily exercising his own free will cognition. Creativity is required. In other words, what we see in science, what we see is this is that code systems only come from intelligence, information only comes from information. As Dr. Gitt goes on to say, there is no known natural law of nature, no known process, no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. By the way, if what Dr. Gitt is saying is true, right at the foundational level, evolution is impossible. Absolutely impossible, and there's no evidence for it. Now you might say, well, how would Richard Dawkins respond to something like that? Well. In a video called From a Frog to a Prince, which Answers in Genesis produces, we have a recording of Dr. Dawkins being asked a question. And I want you to listen to what he has to say. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Well, I just want you to see the evidence for evolution yourself. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I'm not making fun of Dr. Dawkins, but I tell you this, whenever professors are asked that question all around the world, give one example where you see new information added into the genome. They can talk about changes in animals all you like, but when you ask the, the basic question about how matter could produce information in the first place, there's no answer. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? It really is, isn't it? In other words, where did the information come from in our genes, it had to come from greater information. Where did that come from? It had to come from greater information again. Where did that come from? It had to come from greater information again. Where did the code system come from? All experiences tell us it had to come from an intelligence. You know what the Bible says? In the beginning, God, in infinite intelligence, provide the information systems for life. I can't scientifically prove it to you, but guess what? An infinite God who's always been there makes sense of the evidence and fits with real science. You can't prove it ultimately, but you can defend it scientifically. But when you believe, in the beginning, the cosmos, that's actually a blind faith. Christians don't have a blind faith. Christians have a faith that makes sense of the facts and is supported by real science. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? It really is. Well, you know what I'm telling you? Hey, do you realize what we just did? I said, let's take what the Bible says. In the beginning, God, put on those glasses. Let's look at the evidence and let's test it with science. Guess what? We're able to defend it. In the beginning, the cosmos, this belief system didn't work. Now, let me show you another example, a real exciting example, I believe. And it's this. When you start in the Bible, 
In Genesis chapter 1, it says God created distinct kinds of animals and plants, each to reproduce after their own kind. In fact, you find that phrase occurs 10 times in Genesis chapter 1. Now, when I went to university, you know what my, my teachers told me? My professors, they said, oh, the Bible's wrong because it says God made distinct kinds of animals and plants, but we know that animals change. Let me ask you a question. Do animals change? Well, they do. For instance, dogs change, don't they? What do dogs change into? Well, dogs change into dogs. That's right. <laughs> what were they, dogs? What will they be, dogs? What, what are they, dogs? Is that evolution? Actually, that's dogs. That's, that's all it is. I'm sure you've seen, you know, we have wolves, coyotes, dingoes, collie, and so on, all the way down to almost not a dog, uh, and that is <laughs> a poodle. See, a poodle is really the end of the line in regard to dogs, but we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little, little while. Now, see, this is important because I was just over in the British Natural Museum, the Natural History Museum in London, and I walked into the Origin of Species exhibit, you know, and you walk past the bust of Darwin, and the first sign you see is this. Before Charles Darwin, most people believed that God created all living things in exactly the form we see them today. This is the basis of the doctrine of creation. By the way, is that true? No, but you know what? That's, some, that's what our public school students are often taught. They're taught creationists deny real science because they say God made the animals and plants like we see them today. And, 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 and then they've gone on to, to, to be shown that animals change and they say, oh, the Bible's wrong. This is how they dupe our, our students in our education system. Because, see, I don't, I don't believe that statement. I mean, God didn't make poodles. <laughs> poodles are a mess. God said everything was very good. You can't apply that to a poodle, right? <laughs> see, God made the original dog, but a poodle is the result of sin. But we'll talk about that a little, a little later on. Now, then they have this statement here. They say, but Darwin's work supported the view that all living things have developed into forms we see today by a process of gradual change. This is what is meant by evolution. And then they go through and they show you a picture like this. And basically they're saying, look at these dogs. And they have models of dogs. See? See all the changes in dogs? And then they show you weasels. And they say, see all the changes in weasels? In fact, when my wife and I stood before this display, we had a mystical experience. Because we read this sign and it meant so much to us. When weasels breed together, they produce more weasels like themselves. It was, <laughs> it was just, yeah, just incredible, just incredible. But anyway, uh, they go through all of this, and then they say, look at this, changes in dogs, changes in weasels, and so on. And then at the end, they say, there it is, the evidence for evolution. As my wife said, did we miss something? <laughs> now, let me explain all this to you, because let's use dogs to explain these changes. You see, let's assume there were two dogs to start with, all all scientists, Christian and non-Christian, agree that all dogs are the same kind. So we start with two dogs who fall in love, get married, and have kids, okay? And then they end up having lots of dogs. Now, <laughs> I went to public school, as you can see, but, but he, here's the thing. People say, okay, I can see that we get lots of dogs, but how do you get all those, all those different species, varieties, dingoes, wolves, and so on? Well, I'm going to do some basic genetics. Now, some of you might say, I don't like genetics, uh, I've never studied genetics. Look, if you got married and had kids, you've studied genetics, so don't worry about that. And it's much more complicated than this. We're just looking at basic principles. You know how you learn about big A, little a, big B, little b, you know, you, in sexual reproduction, one set of genes from the male, one from the female, and then you get all these offspring, right? By the way, all those offspring there are what? Dogs. They're all a little different from each other, you notice that? You notice the one that has a little a's, little b's, little c's, lost the big A, big B, big C? So it doesn't have the same information as the parents, but it's got the right information to be a dog, right? And so what we, we can understand is from a male and a female, you can get all these different varieties, all these different combinations, but they're still what? Dogs. And by the way, just to give you an idea of the amount of information in our genes, the number of atoms estimated in the known universe, the number of atoms in the known universe is something like 10 to the 80th power. That's a one followed by 80 zeros. The number of electrons estimated you can fit into the universe, something like 10 to the 130th power. But the number of children from two people without having two the same is like 10 to the 2017th power. Isn't that incredible variability that's on our genes? Phenomenal. And God put that in dog genes, cat genes, elephant genes, and so on. Now, let's take biblical history. Let's take the event of Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark lands in the Middle East. And two dogs hop off Noah's Ark, they fall in love, get married, and have kids again. And now we end up with lots of dogs. But this time, you imagine, you have an empty world, all the land animals were killed, 
And as the dog population builds up, you know what's going to happen? You're going to find that certain groups of dogs are going to break off from the others and move in different directions. In fact, we call that in biology the founder principle. And so what could happen is this. For instance, you can imagine if this group of dogs only had the big A, big B genes, and, this, and out here they had the little A, little B, if this group moved off on their own, then they've lost the little A, little B genes and can never regain them again unless they mix back with the original population. Now, let's apply that sort of practically so you understand. Sometimes genes act together like this. Here's an L and S gene together. L means long hair in dogs, S means short hair. Together they give medium fur length in dogs. Well, those that have all S genes have short hair. Those that have L and S, medium fur length. Those that have all L genes, long fur. You imagine if all those with the S genes died out of a population and you're only left with long haired dogs, you might never know they had ancestors that had medium fur length and relatives that had short hair. You see, what can happen is this. You imagine after Noah's Ark, as some dogs move towards a cold climate, and this is what you call adaptation, right? Natural selection. Those that have genes for long hair survive better than those that have genes for short hair. You end up with long haired dogs in a cold climate. You end up with short haired dogs in a hot climate. That's not evolution. You know what that is? Dogs. You just, you're just redistri redistributing the genes. That's, that's all we're doing. The information that was already there. You see, you, you look around the room. You're all a little different from each other, but you're all humans. Some of you have information for black hair, some for brown hair. A lot of you don't have information for hair. Uh, but <laughs> Actually, you do, obviously. It's just more like poodles, and that's the problem. But <laughs> Now, what we do... What happens naturally in the environment, we do it artificially. It's called artificial selection. You've heard of artificial selection, haven't you? We look at this dog and say we're going to breed it with this one and separate it from these, and so on. We end up with our domestic varieties of dogs. But all these domestic varieties of dogs, by the way, when, when you look at them, these domestic varieties of dogs, well, they're all different. They're all a little different from each other. In fact, some of them look very different from each other, don't they? But they're still what? Look at them. They're all still dogs, aren't they? Absolutely. They're all still dogs. Now, what I want you to understand, though, is this process is a process of a loss of information. You even get to the stage where there's not a lot of information left, okay? There's not much in a poodle, but that is not evolution. Hey, friends, think about this. Evolution is an information-gaining process. You know what we observe in science? Information-losing processes. See, if you're going to believe in evolution, Information has to arise from matter over millions of years. New information arise, code systems arise. Remember what Dr. Werner Gitt said? In science, there is no known law of nature, no known process, no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. Now, some, some people say, wait a minute, wait a minute. In school, we're also taught about mutations. It's not just natural selection. It's natural selection plus mutations. You've heard of mutations, haven't you? Poodles are full of them. Okay, that's true, they are. What about mutations? Dr. Lee Spetner, who's a fellow at Johns Hopkins University, said this. All point mutations, when you study them on the molecular level, turn out to, what's that next word? Reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. They reduce genetic information. Do you know how students are duped in public schools? Let me give you an example how they're duped. Ah, but the AIDS virus becomes resistant to drugs. Bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. You see, there's evolution. But you know what they're not told? What really happens at a molecular level. When you get down to the molecular level, not one instance of resistance in, in viruses or bacteria has anything to do with new information. It doesn't. Let me give you one example. There's many different reasons for this, but I'll just give you one example. There's a bacterium, H. pylori, that can cause stomach ulcers. Doctors give an antibiotic. The antibiotic is absorbed through the cell wall of the bacterium. There's a piece of the code of the DNA of the bacterium that produces an enzyme for the biochemistry of the bacterium. But that enzyme, when it comes into contact with the antibiotic, breaks it into substances that destroy the DNA of the bacterium and produce poisons for, to, to destroy it. But if that bacterium has a mutation that disrupts the code producing the enzyme so it no longer produces the enzyme, it no longer breaks the antibiotic into poisons. Now it's become resistant because it lost the ability to do something. And so therefore, uh, the offspring from that bacteria uh, are also going to be resistant, inheriting that same defective gene. But it has nothing to do with evolution. It's a loss of information. See, when students are explained this at a molecular level, their eyes are opened. And they start to realize, we've been duped. We've been brainwashed. There is no evidence. This is not evolution. No, it's not. 
It all fits within a biblical context of, of a perfect world, marred by sin, things running down, information losing. And you see, normally most mutations are edited out in the environment anyway because they're usually harmful. Some can be beneficial to a sort of a limited extent, but none of them are new information. They don't gain new information. But we protect mutations in dogs because if you look at things like, you know, the bulldog, it, it, I mean, it's, you know, jaw and hair, nose stuffed into its face and things like that. Normally that wouldn't survive in the environment or, or dogs like this, as you know, wouldn't survive uh, in, the, in the environment. Or if you take poodles, you know, they're full of mutations, all sorts of mutations in poodles. And so, see, what I'm saying to you is this. If you start off... <laughs> well, I'm just talking about different varieties of dogs here, as you can see. But if we start off with a jar of jelly beans representing all the original information in dogs, over a period of time, you can get less and less information. Same information to be a dog, but less and less variability. You even get to the stage where there's not that much information left, okay? And as you can tell, I don't like cats either, but... <laughs> By the way, this helps us answer a very important question. Anyone ever asked you the question, how did Noah fit all the animals on the ark? You know, humanists ask, ask that question on their website, sometimes at, at seminar programs. Well, how did Noah get all the animals on the ark? <laughs> when I was a teacher at school, I even had kids say to me, so how did Moses get all them animals on the ark? <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you realize something? Noah didn't need to take dingoes, wolves, coyotes, Great Dane, Little Chihuahua, Saint Bernard. He would have thrown poodles overboard anyway. Uh, how many dogs would he need on Noah's ark? He only needed two dogs. When it comes to elephants, how many elephants did he need? Actually, he only needed two elephants. He didn't need millions of elephants, or thousands of elephants, or hundreds of elephants. He just needed two elephants. In fact, when you do your calculations, Noah probably only needed 16,000 individual animals on the ark. There are elephants in Nepal today that actually have the high dome and sloping back characteristic of the mammoth. Some of those genes are still in the mammoth, in the elephant population. They're all closely related, just different species of elephants. You know, it's interesting. When you come to, to talking about Noah's Ark, people scoff that Noah could fit all the animals on the Ark, but probably 16,000 individual animals is all you need. Even in the display on Darwinian evolution, the Natural History Museum, they talked about the fact that during their lifetime, a pair of elephants could give rise to 60 descendants. After 700 years, you have 19 million elephants. Do you think there's plenty of time for animals to come off Noah's Ark and increase in population, split up and move over the earth and form different species and varieties? Absolutely. There was plenty of time for that. And by the way, there's been articles in Science, reported on in US News and World Report that now say that natural selection is a process that happens fast, much faster than they ever thought. Hey, friends, do you realize what I'm saying to you? I'm saying this. Here's another example. The Bible says God made distinct kinds of animals and plants. Put on your glasses, go and look, what do you find? Dogs produce dogs, cats produce cats, elephants produce elephants. Real science of genetics shows that they reproduce within a kind, great variability, mutations, but you don't see an increase in information, no new kinds. You start with what evolution says, one kind changed into another, science doesn't fit the glasses. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? Because we can defend our faith. But then people say to me, but if what you're saying is true, yes, why don't scientists, you know, the majority of them believe it? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says they don't want to believe it, which is one of the reasons why, by the way, we're building a creation museum in northern Kentucky to put all this information in there to show the world because the majority of people don't even get to hear about this evidence. And you can be praying for that creation museum. We'll tell you more about that during the program today. But, you know, in 2 Peter 3, Peter says this, concerning creation, the flood, and coming judgment, he says they are willingly ignorant. They deliberately reject. They don't want to believe. And you say, but a scientist really like that? Hey, the Bible says there's a spiritual aspect to this. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Man doesn't want to believe in God. Let me give you a practical example. Richard Lewontin is a scientist from Harvard University. And he wrote in an article the following. And he's a geneticist from a leading university in America. Here he is, a leading geneticist. He said, Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is a key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to what? Materialism. 
In other words, matter is all there is. That's my starting point, he says. So it doesn't matter how absurd the theories are, how much science doesn't fit it, he says, our commitment is to materialism. And then he goes on and says this, very telling. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. Do you realize what he's saying? There is nothing in science that, that rules out the supernatural. He said there's nothing in science that rules it out. He says, on the contrary, notice something there. We are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation, a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how mystifying to the initiated. Moreover, he goes on, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Isn't that interesting? Hey, by the way, do you realize what he's saying? Exactly what I was saying to you earlier. You know what that is? We all have beliefs to start with that determine the glasses we have on and determine how we look at the evidence. And when he starts from, I don't believe in God, and you say, well, what about all the evidence that you've just shown and, 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 and the science that supports the Bible? And you know what he said? I don't care how absurd the theories are or how much it goes against science because I'm committed to know God. That's what I'm going to believe anyway. You say, why are people like that? You know why people are like that? Because if the Bible's true, and if God made us, if there was Adam in our ancestry, it means God owns us, it means God sets the rules. But you see, if there's ape in your ancestry, if you're just a product of chance random processes, if there's no God, who decides right and wrong? You know, I just spoke at a Rotary meeting, and uh, I was asked to come and speak at a, a, a lunchtime meeting for Rotary. And by the way, you know, the groups like that do a great work. And I'm, I'm not mocking them or anything. Don't get me wrong. But I made a point to them. I, at the end of my talk, after I talked about fossils and, and science and so on, I looked up on the wall and I saw they have their four, I'm not sure what they were, rules or laws of Rotary, whatever they are. And the first one said, is it the truth? I looked at them and said, that's a great statement. I said, you want people to tell the truth? That's great. I said, what if another group starts up next door that has a different truth? How do you determine your truth is the right truth? <laughs> I said, you know what you really want? You really want Christian morality, don't you? You really want, you know, right and wrong and good and bad and for people to understand what's right and what's wrong and so on. I said, I've got news for you. You can't have Christian morality without Christianity. You can't have Christianity without the Bible. And you can't have the Bible without the book of Genesis, by the way, which is foundational to the rest of the Bible. So I said, we better all start believing the Bible. <laughs> you know something? As a Christian... As a Christian, why do I believe what I do? Do you realize, and we'll talk more about this in some of the other sessions, why do I believe in marriage? Well, the doctrine of marriage is based in the book of Genesis. God took dust, made a man, took his side, made a woman. You become one because you're one flesh. It's to be a man and a woman and not a man and a man. Why? Very simple. Now, this is pretty hard to understand for a lot of people. See if you can get it. God made a man and a woman, not a man and a man. Did you understand that? Yeah, it's pretty simple, isn't it? <laughs> hey, by the way, if... If, if you don't believe in a literal genesis, as many churches don't believe, then marriage could be anything you want to make it to mean. It could be a man and a man, a woman and a woman. It's very important to believe the book of Genesis is literal history. Incidentally, all of our doctrines ultimately are founded in the book of Genesis. Every single doctrine ultimately is founded in the history in Genesis 1 to 11. But here's my point. You see, why do I believe in right and wrong? Why do I believe marriage is one man for one woman? Why do I believe that uh, life begins at conception and therefore, you know, aborting a baby is, is, is killing a human being because the Bible's true. Because the Bible is the revealed word of God. Its geology is true, its biology is true, its astronomy is true, its anthropology is true. That's why its morality is true. Because you see, the Bible is a revelation from God, a revelation of history that's true. And sadly, what many people have done is this. They've replaced the foundation of God's word with a foundation that says no man determines truth. See, evolution is more than the mechanism of molecules to man. Evolution is a philosophy that teaches that man by himself determines truth. If you don't start with God's revelation, you start with man, then all is relative. Not only do you interpret geology, biology in a certain way, why not interpret morality in a certain way? If there's no God, no absolute uh, uh, authority, why not write your own rules? Why not do what you want with sex? Why not abort babies? Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids, what's the difference? And friends, I want you to think about this. In America today, America, which was once the greatest Christian nation on earth, here we have the greatest number of Christian bookshops, greatest number of churches, seminaries, Bible colleges, TV stations, Christian TV stations, radio stations, Christian resources, sends the greatest number of missionaries out around the world, and yet is it becoming more Christian or less Christian every day? 
less. Why? What's happened to America? You know what's happened to America? We've lost the foundation that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. We've lost the Bible as real history. We've relegated the Bible to a book of stories or a book about salvation or a book of religion. We've lost that history. We let generations of children be taught a different history, a history of millions of years of evolution and so on that contradicts the Bible's history. Eventually, those children grow up saying, if the world's history is right and the Bible's history is wrong, maybe the message of morality and salvation in the Bible can't be trusted either. We lose that foundation. Now we see increased lawlessness, abortion, homosexual behavior and so on and we're looking at the culture and say what's happened we've changed our foundation and by the way this very much relates too to the issue of say school violence as you bring generations of kids up in a culture where you teach them millions of years of death and, st and suffering brought man into existence and by the way the Bible teaches death and suffering is a consequence of sin we'll talk about that in the next session in particular but you teach them that they're a product of violence they're a product of bloodshed over millions of years. Why shouldn't they eventually start to just act in accord with that? Which is what we see happening more and more and more. You know, I like to sum up really the issue with two diagrams, these Castle diagrams. Here's the foundation of evolution. And evolution is not just molecules to man. It's a philosophy that man by himself determines truth. The more people believe in evolution, the more they believe that man determines truth. Why not write your own rules? Do what you want with sex. Out of that comes those issues that we see in those balloons. Here's the foundation of creation. God's word is truth. The absolute authority. The history in the Bible is true. Out of that comes a message of the gospel. And you see, the humanists are clever. How do you destroy Christianity? Don't aim for the resurrection or the virgin birth. That's obvious. Aim for the Bible's authority. Aim for its history. Get people convinced that the Bible can't be trusted in biology and geology and, and, and so on. That the history is not correct. And ultimately, that structural collapse, and you know what many Christians are doing? They're helping to destroy their own foundation. And then we look up here and say, wow, look at all these problems in the culture. Actually, they're not the problems. They're the symptoms of the problem. You see, the real problem is down here at this foundational level. The real problem is we've changed foundation from God being the absolute authority to man determining truth. We put on a different set of glasses, which is why if we want to be successful in this culture, in dealing with this culture, what we need to do is to restore the foundation of the authority of the Word of God and attack the wrong foundation of history and those weapons and those issues all at the same time. This is the whole battle here. All of it is the battle. We need to be standing against these, these evils in our culture of abortion and so on, fighting the weapons and doing it at a foundational level so that we can restore the right foundation so that we can build the structure. By the way, to help you do that, we have a lot of wonderful materials available. We have a website uh, that uh, people can go to, and uh, you can download millions of years' worth of, worth of uh, information. <laughs> uh, and we also have some great materials. You can get our newsletter. We have a free newsletter that you can, you can get, and we give you a free CD-ROM if you sign up for our newsletter, by the way. We also have a magazine called Creation. It is a startling magazine for the whole family. I encourage you to subscribe to, to Creation Magazine. It's a wonderful tool. We have an in-depth journal as well. We also have special packs. Uh, they're on our website, or you can get them at our seminars. Our introductory pack, the three basic books I encourage everyone to get, uh, my book, The Lie, Evolution, and The Answers book, The Most Asked Questions Answered, Refuting Evolution. Uh, they're the three basic books. We also have uh, six uh, basic books that I encourage everyone to get. Uh, if you can afford it with a couple of videos, we put those in a pack and discount them. And we also have people say, what about the best of everything? We can do that for you too. Uh, the best of everything, the best tools available to equip you. Uh, we also have a set of videos, uh, 12, 30-minute videos that you can use uh, and download off the web, uh, free study guides. We just have a lot of wonderful, wonderful materials available. We have special offers available that you can see in the flyers that we handed out here. Hey, the book in the beginning was information, the most devastating book scientifically to evolution today, I believe. And the video from a frog to a prince, uh, you can get that video. CD-ROMs packed full of information, very inexpensive. Uh, so I encourage you to get those materials. Well, at the end of each of our sessions, we're going to have Buddy Davis uh, to sing a song that sums up what we've been saying. And by the way, he just produced a video that won an award out of 11,000 vi videos, the best children's video. And uh, that's really uh, quite an accomplishment. So, Buddy, uh, why don't you uh, teach us a song as we take this first session out? 
Thank you, Ken. Well, this is a song that I wrote with tongue in cheek about how ridiculous I think the theory of evolution is, and at the same time bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ, our Creator. So we're going to teach you the course. It's real easy to learn, so sing along with me and just have a good time. Here we go. I don't believe in evolution. I know creation's true. I believe that God above created me and you. Credit where it's due. I don't believe in evolution. I know creation's true. I didn't grow out of a palm or swing down from a tree. Adam is my ancestor and not a chimpanzee. God created everything. In six days he was through. So the Big Bang Theory's just a dud and a million years are two. That God above created me and you So praise his name for what he made Give credit where it's due I don't believe in evolution I know creation's true How many of y'all heard about that rock That some people think fell from Mars That's supposed to have had life in it Let me see your hands Okay, now you can get your paws together some folks are all excited about a rock they think's from Mars. They think that rock is telling us there's a life among the stars. They listen deep in outer space for a single yahoo. But Jesus Christ is the only rock that I'm going to listen to. I don't believe in evolution. I know creation's true. I believe that God above created me and you. So praise his name for what he made, give credit where it's due. I don't believe in evolution, I know creation's true. Well, you all ought to know it now. Everybody sing. Here we go. I don't believe in evolution, I know creation's true. I believe that God above created me and you. So praise his name for what he made, give credit where it's due. I don't believe in evolution, I know creation's true. I don't believe in evolution, I know creation's true. Yes, I do. Where did God come from with Ken Ham? We're going to take a brief break, and then at the top of the hour, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, Ken Ham will be back talking with you about the six days of creation. And he says young earth is not the issue, so be ready for that and call a friend to join with you here on the Liberty Channel. Now, dear friend, I would like for you to become a Bible student.